So the, those of you who, uh, who are joining this afternoon, instead of going home on a Friday afternoon, thank you. Um, my brain used to fill up at Walmart about 3 o'clock on Fridays and just could take no more. And I used to try to just find a way to get out of the building about that time. So I had to go visit a store or do something to, to, to get out. So I appreciate you all being here today. The, the last thing I want to do is, is give a lecture. I, I really would like to start a discussion today. Uh, this is, a, I understand, it, the first uh, event like this, and it's going to take more events just like this. It'll be the questions that you all ask and the way that you come together as a result of, of today that will make things happen here in, in the OSHO. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history of the journey that Northwest Arkansas is on. Uh, I'm going to end up inviting you all to be a part of that journey as you figure out what you want to do here. But I'm going to start with a series of questions that you need to ask yourselves. Um, so I'm going to ask for shows of hands. But if you like kind of in your classes, I suspect if you raise your hand, you might get called upon to give an answer. So uh, let's just let's kind of start that way. So, so I'm an entrepreneur by, by heart. Uh, I got a, a, a PhD a long, long, long time ago and decided I really didn't want to teach. In my graduate program, uh, those of you who have, who have been through that, I taught the same class 19 times in three years and said, I just can't go, I can't keep doing this. So I started a business uh, and did consulting work for retailers for about 20 years. Uh, sold that business to a, a big consulting firm, had an exit, thought I had retired, uh, and then got, frankly, just bored to death, and Walmart called and said, if you will come over to Bentonville, we'll find a job for you. And Chet, that's kind of how Walmart works, is to bring in people and, and try to bring them into the family. I had a, had a great run at Walmart for 12 years. Uh, my daughter, uh, who I'm terribly proud of, my oldest, was promoted last week. She's now the EVP and chief merchant of Sam's Club. So any of your Sam's Club complaints, I'll take those today and, and we'll, you know, <laughs> Sunday after church. We'll talk about those, but had the opportunity to go to you know, 20 countries around the world where Walmarts are, are situated and meet lots of people, understand context. And the biggest thing I think I learned, and, and it'll be, it's one of the tenets of building an ecosystem, is you can't take ideas that you've invented in one place and expect that they're going to just go to another place and stick. Uh, when I took the job at Walmart to do this big international thing, my boss, uh, Mike Duke, the CEO at the time, said, we want you to take all this great stuff you're doing in the U.S. and go around the world and, and have them do the same thing. And I, naively, I thought, I could do that. And so, And the first time you go into Sao Paulo and you realize that there's 35 million people in one city and there's no stoplights and you can't possibly get trucks on time, you realize that that really nice engineering solution that you built uh, just isn't going to work there. So contextual uh, understanding about what it is that you all have, where do you want to go, and how you go there is really, really key. And I have scars on my back from Walmart to, to explain that. So uh, about five years ago now, I've been gone from Walmart for uh, heavily involved in what was this emerging STEM uh, world. Uh, I just couldn't hire enough engineers to come to work in Northwest Arkansas from places like MIT and Georgia Tech and Purdue and Stanford. Just like you'd have a conversation with these great graduates about moving to Bentonville, Arkansas, and they just kind of laugh at you. Like, really, I'm not, I mean, how about Chicago or Dallas? Uh, and so we started down a path of how do we get more involved in Arkansas and growing STEM talent. Uh, out of that came this, this uh, desire to figure out how do you actually start, you know, back in the K through 12, bringing an understanding of science and math and, and frankly, arts. Now, I'm more of a STEAM guy now than, than I was a STEM guy. Um, left Walmart and joined the community in Northwest Arkansas, which was just starting. So it's just, just been a four-year journey here uh, of starting to build this entrepreneurial ecosystem you know, with the help of some very generous people in the Walton family and, and, and others there. Uh, so the quality of life investment was going on, uh, you know, trails that if you're a bike rider and you're crazy if you are because all my friends have some broken bone, 
uh, from that. Our, ch our chamber president was in the hospital three days this week because he had a bike accident over the weekend and broke a collarbone. And he's proud of that. He, he put it in Facebook, the pins and, and the plate in his collarbone, and the punctured lung. So, uh, but they've built this environment and are building this environment in Northwest Arkansas that starts with building a community that's attractive to young people. Uh, and then they want to build businesses using that talent in the area to diversify the, the economy that we have here. Um, I have two grandchildren in Bentonville, um, two daughters that are in town, a son-in-law. Uh, and when we left, like a lot of Walmarters, you don't necessarily retire in Arkansas because you pay 6 or 7% state income tax and you can go to Dallas or Nashville and, and save yourself 6.5%. And my wife and I were driving to Dallas to look for an apartment the week after I left Walmart thinking, well, McKinney, we can get back in five hours. And we got on the other side of Fort Smith and, and Sandra looks at me and she goes, what are we doing? Is we're going to be five hours away from our grandkids. And what's the most important thing in life right now? Grandkids, if you have them out there. And we turned around on I-40 and drove home and said, that's nuts. So I got very involved in trying to build something in Bentonville, Rogers, Fayetteville now for my grandkids. You know, I want them to have the opportunities 20 years from now that are beyond what they can imagine uh, and that's been a journey, it's been a, a labor of love, and there's a number of people that are doing that. And so that's really what I want to talk to you about for about 30 minutes here is, is that. Let me describe Northwest Arkansas, because it's right down the street from you all. I worked for 12 years in the middle of it at Walmart and knew nothing about what was going on there because Walmart is so consuming uh, to your time and your attention out there. But we've got 550,000 people now from Fayetteville to, to Bella Vista. It's a big community that's growing every day. And it's one of the top five uh, fastest growing per capita communities in the country out there. We've got three great employers. You know, you've got Walmart, J.B. Hunt, and Tyson that are there. Uh, University of Arkansas is probably the next biggest employer. We have 2.9 or less percent unemployment. Everybody that wants a job has a job there, great quality of life. And we had a consultant come in from the University of Texas, uh, and he met with about 50 of us that are kind of in this uh, leadership group, and he said, you know what, guys? I see Detroit in 1970. So those of you who are old enough like me with a little gray hair, can you remember that when Detroit had the big three automakers and was the place that you wanted to be? Uh, and then the auto industry failed and Detroit failed and now is starting to rebuild, but it was a rust bucket. And so they looked at the group and said, you know what, if Walmart doesn't win the battle with Amazon, uh, what happens to Walmart here in, in our area? What happens to that talent? Uh, if J.B. Hunt is a trucking company, and, and certainly in 10 years, maybe before that, we'll have autonomous trucks that'll be running down the street. What does that do to the J.B. Hunt uh, business? What does it do to the 50,000 truck drivers that are out there in our area? And Tyson Chicken, which is a, you know, mostly a manufacturing for, for proteins, it'll be the first industry that goes automation. So already looking at robotics to how do you cut and process chickens uh, to put them into dog food and people food out there. So think about not next year, because Walmart's not going to fail in one year, uh, but 10 years or 20 years from now, it will not look the way it is and scared the heck out of, of people in the audience like, oh gosh, we're thinking that life is really good, and it is. We better start thinking about what might happen and build a better base for Northwest Arkansas or we'll find ourselves going the way of Detroit. So that's the kind of where we are right now. So it's, uh, it's hard when you're living in an environment where everything is great uh, to tell people that you need to watch out because things might not be great if we continue down this path. It's going to change. So getting on your soapbox and trying to, to be a little bit hyperbolic and talk about the future, uh, sometimes people just look at, look at you and kind of 
kind of laugh because they're so consumed that they just can't see that. But I'm genuinely worried, and there's a number of us, that Northwest Arkansas, as well as it's being run, um, could be a very different place 10 years from now. So about the time my grandkids start into junior high and high school, it's like, well, that might not be the place where, where we want them to live. So when I left Walmart, and Chad, I'm going to leave this with you, I had a chance to do just benchmarking around the, the country on uh, the ecosystems that are out there. What are the most successful? And I, in Washington, D.C., I ran onto a, a white paper. So if you're interested in this, there's, you, can, you can Google it, uh, Innovation That Matters. There's a giant PDF, but it's a, for you stat hounds out there, is it's a very data-driven analysis of what does it take to create a competitive entrepreneurial innovation ecosystem, a city and a community. And they rank the top 25 in this particular uh, paper out there. But the more important thing is they tell you why they rank it. And one of the things I'm going to talk about today, and we we'll just focus on one of those, it's all about the community that's built and the servant leadership of that community is critical. There's another uh, other components, but if, you, if you're serious about thinking about Neosho one year, two years, ten years from now, and what, is, what it will become or what it could become, I really recommend this as a read. It's a fast read. You can read it in an hour. And then there's 100 pages, Chet, of data that you can download that talks about the scorecards that are, that are out there. So it's a, it's a really great read out there. The second thing I'm going to leave you uh, is, a, is one of my favorite books, and Jeanette had it on her uh, slide set, is called The Rainforest. Uh, it is written by a group of, of people that started out in Silicon Valley, the San Jose, San Francisco area now that's just famous for an entrepreneurial ecosystem that's out there. But they take it back to the very beginning and describe what were the building blocks that created that. And they talk about, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, there was nothing going on in the Bay. Uh, it wasn't that even a desirable place to live. It had one big smart school there with Stanford, but not a lot of money and not a lot of, of energy. And a group of people, a small group of people, came together and began to have a cohort of people that had like-mindedness and wanted to build something special. And, and the rainforest, and I'll talk a little bit about it uh, here in the next few minutes, but it's a great how-to book, and so I'm going to leave this to you all, both, uh, both those. Those are great reference guides if you want to start to, to transform what you, what you have here. Um, the Northwest Area Council, we're, we're blessed. So Sam and J.B. Hunt and, and Don Tyson, John Tyson, years ago, years ago, 35 years ago, uh, could see the competitive nature that goes on in Northwest Arkansas. I mean, you've got a bunch of entrepreneurs, if you think about it up there, that think they've got the answers. Uh, and they created something they call it the Northwest Area Council. I think of it as a, a super chamber of commerce. It's a group of business leaders, about 100 to 150, uh, and they sit above the five cities that we have in the two counties of Northwest Arkansas, and they manage big projects. So the airport was the first project that they brought in. XNA was a direct result of this group of people coming up with a plan, lobbying in Washington, getting the funding to get XNA built. Uh, the, widening of the, the widening of 49, uh, water treatment, the big infrastructure projects that are required in a community is growing as fast as ours, that if you left it up to the individual mayors and and chamber presidents would never get done because they'd want it to happen there first. Uh, so the Sam and, and the, the leaders back then were really, really smart uh, to do that. So in the, in the time that I've been here, I've worked on the Strat Plan three times. About every three years, we re-up it. And the latest one, which came out about a year now, about October of last year, was the first time the council recognized that it's not about infrastructure. You can't ignore that we need more clean water and we need more trash in the roads. You can't ignore that. It's about talent. And so the whole strategy is revolves around talent attraction and talent retention. So if you grow up in Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, if you go to the U of A, and a lot of them don't because they want to you know, escape from home and go someplace else, 
it's hard to get them back until they get to a point in life where they go, you know what, we've got three kids, we should go back home and raise our kids. But to keep that young talent in our area is a challenge. Uh, in Bentonville today, something like 65, 70% of the people that live in Bentonville proper were not born in Arkansas. They're transplants in because of the enterprise businesses that we have. And if you're watching anything going on at Walmart closely, and it's not in the news, but those of us who have friends and family there, they continue to revamp their workforce. There's been a lot of changes at Walmart, a lot of great talent that are no longer working at Walmart, uh, and they're forced to either think about, what's the career I want in Northwest Arkansas, or do I have to move some other big city, go to Seattle and, and work for Amazon, or go out to Chicago, or go to New York City, and there's a lot of this great talent that we have in Northwest Arkansas that's making that migration out, and we lose that talent. We lose a 20-year Walmart that was a brilliant cybersecurity uh, person that we could have kept if we'd had a place for them. So GRIT started um, when Jeanette and I first got together now, four years ago, I guess, when I left Walmart, um, was to fill a gap that we need to diversify our economy so that we're not as dependent on the three big companies that we love. Because if you leave Walmart, as, a, as an example, and you're making $100,000, which is not an unusual thing at Walmart, when you leave them, there aren't very many opportunities in town to make that same amount of money unless you want to go to work for J.B. Hunt or Tyson, and a lot of people don't want to do that. So how do we build out more businesses in our community for our young people to go work for that are cool, so it feels more like a Dallas or an Austin or a Kansas City, and then how do we find a place for our existing talent uh, to land? So if you boiled it down and, and looked at the, you know, about a dozen people that are just key to the transformation that we're trying to drive there, what do you want to become? You get the word, we want to become our version of Austin. So they sealed the coolness and the growth and the university and the entrepreneurship and the investment dollars. And so very clear north direction, we want to become Austin. And now what do you have to do to build that out? So, so Northwest Arkansas, 45 minutes from here, is on a long journey. I, you know, it, it will not be completed in my lifetime. Uh, but it's, they're on the journey, and I think we've got, got a lot of momentum uh, that's out there. I, I think my challenge to you all today um, is, and I just have some questions. Um, you know, the biggest opportunity is, do you see the need to change the community of Neosho? Is it going to continue to be stable? Is it a community that's going to continue to lose uh, population? Uh, is it a community that you could do something here to attract more talent as a part of that? And, and I'm going to bias this whole conversation with you need to do things to find ways to transform to attract people to be here. Otherwise, there are a lot of rural communities in our country that are just getting smaller and smaller and smaller uh, out there. So is there a sense of urgency in, in this community to change, to start to think about things differently. Uh, if there's not, then you really don't want to listen to me because that's my whole life is saying we have to change and we got to change now. Uh, if, it, if you do feel that, then some of the things I want to share with you for the next few minutes I think are just critical and there's a number of, of guidebooks and benchmarks that are, that are out there. So if I asked you today, and I'm not going to because it's really a hard question, but can you tell me what you'd like Neosho and the area around Neosho to become? Can you describe what you want uh, out of that? Uh, Infrastructure-wise, quality of life-wise, opportunity-wise, uh, those are the kind of the big questions that I think that have to be asked. Uh, and frankly, we probably have struggled with that in Northwest Arkansas uh, for two years to think about what is it that we become and are, are we on a track to get there. But until you know where you want to go, you don't know how to get to where you want to go. And I think that's the first question, Chet, that people need to ask here is, is it important? And if it is important, 
and how do we get started uh, on that? Um, you know, I think we laughingly, I can remember sitting with one of the folks that was our sponsor, uh, it's now been four years ago, uh, and describing how quickly do you expect that we're going to get the, your vision out there? And the answer was, oh, no more than five years. Uh, and I think I, I naively at the point goes, we can do that. And thinking, there's not a chance. And, you know, now that we're five years into this, it'll be another 10 years. So it's a journey. You're going to be on this for a long time. Uh, and I want to talk to you a little bit in a minute about a, a concept called grit. Uh, we're grit studios. And so there's a concept that just is this per, uh, per, pervasiveness of this resilience to, to actually stick with the goal that you're that you're on out there. Um, and then I think the kind of the last question here, and I want to get into servant leaders, is who needs to go on the journey? Not everybody needs to go. E eventually, everybody needs to be a part of that. But as you start to think about who's going to lead the journey, who is, who's that group of people or that organization? What's that cohort number seven <laughs> that you need out there that's really a group of people that are like-minded about taking this journey because it's hard work, it takes a long time, but I keep after it because I worry if we don't that Northwest Arkansas won't be a place that my grandkids will, will want to live, and that would be disappointing it, it, for me at this point in my life. Um, so let me des describe a few of the things, and you heard some of these this morning, of what does the community of Neosho need to, to look like from the outside? What's it need to feel like on the, on the inside? So. I think the first one is that you, you have to sense a diversity. And, and I'm not talking about just the diversity of gender or ethnicity. I'm talking about a diversity of experiences, of education, a way of solving problems that are out there. So, and that oftentimes comes, and the reason I have partners like Jonathan and Jeanette is we don't think about anything alike, but we get into a room and close the door and the solution is always better than if we'd have taken one of the three of us is because we just come at problems in a very different way. What's that diversity look like here? What's that cohort that you need to build have to include? And who needs to go on that, on that trip out there? You all hit it really good this morning, but two things are happening in Northwest Arkansas. Again, 550,000 people is we're building these communities. Uh, and they're cross-functional communities. So we have some pure communities and generally organized around something like the, um, a, 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 we have a cybersecurity community now of people that are terribly interested in this technology of cybersecurity. And they meet once a month, they come together, they've created they're different companies around town, but they've created a network of experts in cybersecurity because they're interested in one another's careers. They want to learn something about one another. Uh, frankly, they're always open for other uh, job opportunities in the area. And so it's become a group of people who are watching each other's back. Um, we've got a group, I think it was in GRIT. This, the, you heard a little bit about this, the, the, the women's leadership. There's been an African-American group in there. We're getting ready to host a, a Latino entrepreneur group. So there are groups of people out there that have things in common. They need a place, and they need a group of people to pull them together so that they can feel each other's need and look out for each other. And then what, what you'll see here in about a month is the Northwest Arkansas Tech Summit, which this year uh, will be three days, and it will take all those communities and dump them in together for three days and ask them to learn from one another to meet one another, to share experiences, share food, share music, get on a bike if you're crazy, uh, and just enjoy each other and, and learn out there. So this building a diverse community is really, really important to just, if nothing else, to look at problems through different sets of, of eyes that are out there. You, you have to have, um, we're talking a little bit of this at lunch, you gotta have people involved in your culture that are selfless that aren't, aren't in it for themselves, they're in it for the greater good, and they're in it to help the people around them. Uh, I use the example uh, of in Northwest Arkansas, you know, it's a, it's a, 
it's a rich community with all the ex Walmarters that are in there and Tyson and J.B. Hunt people, uh, and they're generous people, but they have invested heavily into startups in our area, the Angel Association that's there, really knowing that they may or may not get a return for that investment. They're investing in it because it's the right thing to do. They like the people that they're helping out there. If they make money on that, and they probably did would make more money buying, selling real estate, or frankly just having Walmart stock the last few, few years have been a pretty good investment. But because they have this sense of responsibility for the community, they make these angel investments. They write these $25,000 checks and say, here's, here's my money, go do good things with it out there. So this sense of personal incentives isn't the thing that people are leading with. It's about trying to make sure that the community comes first. This selflessness is really, really critical for, a, I think, a vibrant culture uh, in this area. And the last one is, is, is grit. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of a lady, her name is Angela Duckworth? Any show of hands? Ah, great. I mean, she is a, she's a, a psychologist, she's an educator, and she got curious as to what are the characteristics of successful people. Uh, and through her studies, you know, there's, you guys could probably list some of those out there. Chet, you could, you could probably list those from your background. Uh, it boiled down to, it's not IQ, it's not education, it's not where you were born, it's grit. It's the ability to latch on to something that you want terribly and not let go of that over a long period of time. This tenaciousness of a purpose is what Angela has written, and she's written a book, it's a great book if, you, if, you're, if you're a reader, called Grit. Uh, and there's a, a, a TED talk out there, TED.com, it's only six minutes, uh, so it, you get through it quickly, and she gives you a synopsis of her research. Uh, but she did a, a ton of research at the military academy and followed classes of military graduates. And then she did some deep research into some of the schools in Brooklyn, uh, New York, and followed kids through their, their education and found that it's not correlated with the things that we normally think advantage kids. It's more deeply correlated to the ability to stick with it. Uh, out there. And so it's a journey that you're going to go on and the community is going to go on it. And I say that for personal experiences that the three of us will look at one another and, and, and we had a pretty good week this week. You know, we made three or four steps forward, but last week it felt like we were lost. You know, just you're three steps forward, two steps back, and you got to hang in there. So creating this sense of, of, of grit is terribly, terribly important. The second one here. Is, is access. I, I don't know, how, how big is Neosho? 12,000 feet. 12,000 feet, I was gonna guess 20,000 feet. So it's a small community. The first time we met, we talked about that we have a hard time in Northwest Arkansas with all of the talent and density we have of being dense enough to matter. And so GRIT has built a network of people all over the world. I had a group in, before I could get here this morning, that flew in from Dubai. They're part of our network because they want to be a part of Northwest Arkansas, they want to be a part of the Walmart world and the retailer world, but they're now connected to Northwest Arkansas and their offices are in Dubai. Uh, right after that, had a conversation with a group that came from Austin. Uh, so how do you how do you build this network? And I'm gonna offer up that we're building one 45 minutes from here. Uh, we do almost everything virtually on our Zoom out there. It, the world is just a tiny little place right now electronically. Is how do you become a part of an existing network where you have access to money, investors, mentors, experts, and coaches? Because if you rely on that here, you'll never make it. You'll be too slow to do that organically. So how do you reach out to your neighbor? I was in Stillwater, Oklahoma all day yesterday at, at Oklahoma State, uh, which is my alma mater, and talking about how do we take what you all are trying to do in Oklahoma and connect it 
as hard as that sounds to what's going on in Northwest Arkansas. How do I get the University of Arkansas and Oklahoma State University to start seeing themselves as partners because together they might actually go after uh, a University of Texas or a Stanford or a Georgia Tech. Apart, they'll fight a battle, but they'll never catch up. The, the world will, will lead, them, uh, lead them behind. So, so access to the network, I think, is just critical because you're isolated and you're small. Heck, we're isolated and small down the road from you. And so our partnerships are Kansas City, New York City, Seattle, San Francisco, San Diego. We want to be a part of the big communities and, and invite them to be a part of ours and find the synergies that, that's out there. So it's really, really, really important for you all to find a way, Chet, to connect into to, to a network that's growing. Uh, and you and I talked about it a year ago that it's, uh, it's not a hard connection. It's just an interest level uh, to go through that. Um, I think the last thing, and, and really the rest of what I want to talk about today and, and, and take some questions, is you've got to have servant leaders. And I know that's the theme of this, but I think servant leadership uh, oftentimes just gets misdefined. Uh, you know, at Walmart, we have, you know, Sam's book, if you've ever read the book, talks about servant leadership. And there are lots of quality service servant leaders at Walmart, but it, it begs to just be a name of something on a poster if it's not lived out there, uh, if it's not part of the fabric of the community. And it, it's, a, it's a great book. It's a great thing to say it's important, but unless you have real servant leaders, you got nothing out there. So one of the authors that you referred me to is this Robert Greenleaf. And let me just read uh, what servant leadership is by him. So servant leadership begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve and to serve first. Then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. The difference manifests, manifests itself in the care taken by the servant first to make sure that other people's highest priority needs are being served. It doesn't describe our world anymore. Uh, those of you who are less than 40, I can remember now 20 years ago uh, on vacation and, and finding the the first t-shirt, and we laughed at it. My wife were and I were talking about it yesterday, driving back from Stillwater last night. It said, it's all about me. And we just laughed at that, thinking, oh my gosh, this is not true. It is. You know, I sat with students yesterday and just that are you know, 20 at, at the university over there, and, and their perspective of the world is different than most of you all have as a perspective of the world. It really is centered on themselves, and not on the people around them. So it's not servant leadership. Servant leadership starts with the thought that people around me are more important than I am, and I'll benefit personally by serving them. Uh, it really is the, the, the key to servant leadership uh, out there. Um, and you don't have a lot of good role models, uh, frankly, in our, in our world uh, today out there. In this book, The Rainforest, there's a, a, they use a term called keystones uh, as a servant leader. So it's kind of the code word in, in, in these authors use. And keystones, let me read the rainforest definition, is keystones, so servant leaders in an entrepreneurial community like Neosho, are individuals that connect people, ideas, investment dollars, expertise, customers, workers across the ecosystem. They are human bridges that connect people outside of the normal circles of life to create a larger, contiguous community. Big words there. They're matchmakers. They're the people that say, I think this is so important that I'm going to get myself out of the way, and I'm going to make sure that things don't conflict, that people collaborate. I'm going to insist on a way of working here in Neosho that is for the community first, and not for one individual uh, 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 company here, we're times five. I mean, I, I, I laughingly sent out uh, a note to the heads of our Chamber of Commerce, I mean, you know, five of them last week, inviting them to meet one of our BRIT members. Uh, and the first two folks responded back, said, 
if we, if we sign up, can we have exclusivity to them? Well, no, you can't. I, so the competitive nature of a chamber president is I need this for my city. And we're always saying, this isn't about the cities. It isn't about the individual school systems or the chambers. It's about two c counties in Northwest Arkansas, Benton and Washington, that we gotta think about regionally. So breaking down these barriers and this competitiveness that's out there, these silos, is critical for Keystones. Keystones are the ones who can step back, and you've got them in your community, and can see the bigger picture and call it when somebody gets out of their lane and make sure that that siloed behavior is minimized uh, out there. So specifically, they connect people and then they step back. Um, and, and I'm at a point in my life, I'm just blessed to be, I'm almost 65 years old, I've had a fantastic career. Most important thing in my life right now is my wife, my grandkids, in that order, and my kids. Uh, and so <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, truly, truly, those, those of you who have grandkids, right, because you, you can give them back, it's great. I, I, I love giving them back after a week. Uh, is that's the priority. And so thinking about the people around you that you want to touch and help is critically important. And I just happen to be at a point in my life where that's my priority. You all have people in this community that can do the same thing. Uh, maybe not uh, as mature as me, uh, maybe still in the ripe of their life, but their focus is on the community and not on what they need to get done today for themselves. It, it is that selflessness that's out there. Uh, they're motivated by longer term measures that are out there. Um, I'm a Christian by, by faith. Uh, I can remember leaving Walmart thinking, man, I got, uh, you know, I'm 60 years old. I, I've had a big position at Walmart. I'm going to spend the next 20 years of my life building out my legacy. What are people going to think about? Rick Webb when he dies someday. Uh, and I was on a plane ride from a, come back from a client, and I listened to, a, to some songs on my headphones. And there's one, if you're a Casting Crowns fan out there called uh, Only Jesus, it changed my life. So, <sighs> so putting, putting people ahead of you is the most important thing for these keystones that are out there. Um, they got to break down the silos that we talked a little bit about that. Most importantly, you describe me as an agitator, and I, and I enjoy poking people uh, in, a, in a nice way. Uh, but you also got to get work done. You got to do real things. And so last yesterday, again, back, back in Stillwater, they're talking about the difference between mentors and coaches and how do you grab these in our case, 200 students in the industrial engineering department and give them a mentor, somebody that they can reach over, call, I got a problem, I need to just talk, invest your time in my life, and coaches, which Jonathan and, and Jeanette are coaches, they get involved in your life. They're there uh, at a much deeper level than just a mentor out there. And you're gonna need both out here. And that's what part of what Keystones do, is they invest themselves into activities and people in this community that want to do something special for the community that, that's out there. And these guys are, are just great at, at doing that. So some rules of engagement and then some action plans, and, and, and I'll, I'll hush up here. So rules, rules of engagement, you got to dream. Uh, again, go back to the beginning. If you don't think there's a problem here, then why do you need to go solve it? But if you look at this through the lenses of people moving and what might be, I get, you know, I'm a, a, a former Walmart, there's a, a, a healthy paranoia out there, then you have to be thinking about dreaming, what is it gonna be? So you, you gotta listen and learn. I had an executive coach at Walmart that was terribly, critical of my management style, enough so she just beat me up about once a week for about six months, and she said, you listen to respond. I did, you know, I'm a pretty smart guy, so I'm gonna listen to you so I can get, tell you something back. She goes, no, 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 you have to listen to understand. 
and that's very different. So how do you listen and learn? Because there's so much around us that's going on out there. So a rule of engagement out there. Uh, always assume best intentions. Are really hard for, for me, frankly, but trust and be trusted uh, out there. Uh, experiment together. So people who are doing things as individuals are great, but there's power in the community coming together and experimenting. And we could talk for a whole other session on experimenting. It's what you talked about, it's, the, it's failing. Uh, it's okay to fail out there. Um, and then finally the last one is just pay it forward. You know, how can you give in your life something to the person that's coming behind you out there? And then just quickly, uh, what do you need to go do next? This is just, this is Rick's opinion. So go find your keystones. Who are they out there? Though if you're a keystone, identify yourself. Start to build a leadership group here of who are the keystones. Find ways to collaborate. The more collaboration you're doing, the better. Uh, where are we as a culture? Where are the gaps? What do we need to do? Uh, what's it going to take to dream and be what we want to be? Because it's going to require resources and time and a roadmap out there. Uh, and in my opinion, you need to start like this afternoon, right after the homecoming parade. People ought to start talking before the, the football game tonight about what do we need to be doing? Do we can we define what where where North is for Neosho? So, thanks, Jeff. Mm -hmm.